the family resided in the Roseway neighborhood of Northeast Portland, and they were described by those who knew them as a very happy family. The evening before their disappearance on the 6th of December 1958, Kenneth and Barbara had attended the home of a family friend for a Sunday dinner. When asked about their plans for the next day, the couple informed everyone they were planning to drive to Columbia River Gorge to gather greenery for Christmas decorations. The family members consisted of Kenneth Martin, 54, his wife Barbara, 48, and their three daughters, Barbara, 14, Virginia, 13, and Susan, 11. The family's eldest son, Donald, was in the United States Navy and stationed in New York during the time they vanished. The following morning, police theorized the family climbed into Kenneth's 1954 cream and red Ford Country Squire station wagon just after lunch. Neighbors recall the family leaving around 1 p.m. and they were seen to set off on their trip. Sightings of the Martins throughout that afternoon were few. Dean Baxter, gas station proprietor, reported that he encountered the family when they purchased five gallons of gasoline from his store in Cascade Locks at around 4 p.m., approximately 40 miles from their home in Portland. According to Mr. Baxter, he remembered seeing their car continuing eastwards after they had filled their vehicle. Some two weeks after, the credit card receipt for the petrol arrived at the family home, confirming the service station owner's statement. Shortly after this sighting, waitress Clara York reported to the police that she had served the family at around 5 p.m. at the Paradise Snack Bar in Hood River. She later reported that the family was smiling and happy and that they ordered burger and fries. Other reports from passing motorists indicated that the family were spotted at an unspecified location on the north bank of the Columbia River in Washington State towards dusk. The waitress and other witnesses who saw the family that day said Kenneth was wearing a tan zip-up jacket and dark slacks, while Barbara wore a navy blue coat, a plaid jacket and a black print dress. The eldest daughter, Barbie, was dressed in jeans with rolled cuffs and a beige coat. On December the 9th, Kenneth didn't show up to his job at Eccles Electric Home Service Company, while Barbie was noted absent from her morning classes at Grant High School. Both Susan and Virginia were also reported absent by their teachers at Rose City School. Both employer and headmaster found this extremely unusual as both father and daughter were very conscientious about attendance. The family was officially reported missing that evening by Kenneth's boss, Taylor Eccles. Police routinely investigated their residence at approximately 11 p.m. that evening. The doors and windows showed no signs of forced entry or any indication that a violent incident had occurred within. A bundle of laundry was still in the washing machine, and dishes from the previous day were left on a drying rack in the kitchen. There hadn't been any substantial withdrawal of money from the Martins' bank accounts. In fact, nothing to suggest anything suspicious or hinting at foul play. Searches were undertaken by both Multnomah County and Hood River County Police but all potential leads came to a dead end. A stolen white Chevrolet registered in Venice, Los Angeles, California, was found in Cascade Locks the day of the Martins' disappearance, but was quickly dismissed by investigators as it did not match the Martins' vehicle. Also found very close to the site of the abandoned Chevrolet was a 38 caliber Colt Commander handgun, which had been thrown into the bushes. This was found to be covered in dried blood. The handgun was bagged for evidence, but for some inexplicable reason was not investigated any further. The gun's serial number was traced to a Meyer and Frank department store, and it was subsequently discovered that the gun had been among several other sporting good items that the son and brother of the missing family, Donald Martin, 
had been accused of stealing while working at the store two years prior. He was afterwards fired for stealing the goods valued to the amount of $2,000. When Donald Martin's parents and sisters vanished, he was allegedly miles away, stationed in New York with the United States Navy. The following day, police arrested and charged Roy Light and another unnamed man for the theft of the white Chevrolet. Both men were convicted felons and had been in the snack bar at the same time as the Martin family. The waitress reported the two men had left at the same time as the family. However, Police again failed to investigate if the two men were involved in the disappearance of the Martins. Investigators received various tips in the weeks and months following the family's disappearance. Among them was a report from an orchard owner east of Portland, who claimed to have witnessed a man and woman on December the 7th gathering greenery in a canyon where a Native American burial ground was located. He stated that the following week, he noticed a flock of buzzards flying in the same direction. The canyon was subsequently searched, but there was no trace of the missing family. On December 28, 1958, a woman's glove was discovered near the site of the abandoned Chevrolet, which family members said was similar to gloves Barbara would wear. However, a positive identification could not be made. During the month of February 1959, searches were undertaken on Mount Hood. During this time, a volunteer searcher found tire tracks leading off a cliff near the Dalles, which reportedly matched the tires on the Martins Ford. Minute paint chips recovered at this location were sent to the FBI for analysis, and it was determined that the paint was the same paint used on the make and model of the Martins vehicle. Investigators explored the possibility that the Martins vehicle may have plunged into the river, and so the United States Army Corps of Engineers lowered the level of the river by five feet in the lake behind Bonneville Dam. This was then searched using sonar technology, but yielded no results. On May the 1st, 1959, a river drilling rig near the Dalles snagged something of substantial weight on its anchor. However, while being pulled to the surface, it became dislodged. In the early hours of May the 2nd, a fisherman and his wife reported seeing what appeared to be two bodies floating downstream near Cascade Locks. They later spotted them again near Bonneville Dam. On the afternoon of May the 3rd, the body of Susan was discovered on the north bank of the Columbia River, near Camus, Washington. Her identity was positively confirmed by dental records. The following morning, May the 4th, the body of Virginia was discovered near Bonneville Dam, also confirmed by dental records. Both bodies were in advanced stages of decomposition. Susan's body was taken to the Clark County Medical Examiner's Office before being transferred to Multnomah County in Portland for autopsies on both bodies to be performed. The cause of death for both of the girls was officially declared as drowning. Traces of metal, including aluminium, was recovered from Susan's clothing. Rupert Gilmouth, the sheriff of Hood River County at the time, suspected that the drilling rig had overturned the Martin's car at the bottom of the river and dislodged one of the doors, allowing the bodies of Susan and Virginia to escape and surface downstream. Investigators put forward the theories that the family may have died as a result of Kenneth crashing their vehicle into the river, or that the family had been abducted, murdered and their vehicle with them in it pushed into the river. In December 1966, eight years after the family's disappearance, elder son Donald, the only surviving member of the family, inherited the family's modest estate, which had been in mandated probate for seven years. It must be noted that at the time of his family's disappearance, Donald did not return home to join the search for his family, 
and instead stayed at the New York Navy base. He was subsequently interviewed over the phone. It must also be noted that Donald had a strained relationship with his family. The cremated ashes of Susan and Virginia remained at the Riverview Abbey Mausoleum in Portland, unclaimed for over a decade after their deaths. On December 30th, 1969, their urns were retrieved by an unknown individual. Walter Groven, a Portland detective, wrote that Donald was a suspect and the only one with a motive, and that he believes the family met with foul play. He believes that the murders would be solved once their car was found. Multnomah County Police also consistently suspected foul play in the Martins' disappearance. Based on the evidence of the tire tracks that indicated the family's vehicle was deliberately pushed from the cliff. There is also the question of the gun discovered close to the stolen car. The gun was established to have been the weapon that Donald stole from the store where he had been employed. Donald only came once in March 1959 to settle the family's estate as sole beneficiary. He didn't attend the memorial service of his sisters Susan and Virginia. After Donald inherited the estate, he moved to Hawaii, got married and had children, and never spoke publicly about his parents and sisters. He died in 2004. Donald's parents, Ken and Barbara, were apparently very strict and religious. After the theft incident at Maya and Frank, they sent Donald to a Christian college, which he soon left to enlist in the Navy. But the incident which caused the most strain between Donald and his parents was that his parents discovered he had been romantically involved with another man. Both the Maya and Frank store management and a friend and roommate of Donald's stated that he confessed to having been under enormous personal strain and that his parents were none too pleased about his homosexual affair. As of today, Kenneth, Barbara and Barbie's bodies have not been found. The family car has also not been located, but is believed to be still on the bottom of the Columbia River near Cascade Locks. Well, my dear friends, yet another disappeared vehicle, along with its occupants, never to be found again. I do love these cases. I'll probably do some more scattered uh, in the future. Uh, this case here, very annoying, uh, because they know that the car is down there. I do not understand why they don't go down and, and find it, unless the... Uh, area or the river itself is very dangerous to investigate. Maybe somebody can give me more information on that. I don't know how it is geographically, whether it's too dangerous, but that's obviously what happened as that uh, detective or policeman surmised is that the, the drill overturned the car, the, the, the rusted car door opened and the two rear passengers, the two girls, floated out. So they know the car's down there. I don't really understand that. Um, yeah, it's obviously, I think if it had been a prominent person instead of just a family who are, you know, just normal working class family, if it had been a prominent person, they probably would have investigated and brought that vehicle up. Hmm, things that make you go, hmm. Yeah, I don't like to uh, make accusations against dead men who can't speak for themselves, but if that's a coincidence that the gun that the son stole happened just to be there at that location then my goodness that is one hell of a coincidence it just seems a bit strange to me why didn't he come back and collect his sister's ashes why didn't he come to the the memorial service all these unanswered questions sort of uh, points you in a certain direction but i i don't want to go out i don't want to out and out say it but um yeah, it does seem rather, rather suspicious. Who were those men? Were they hired by someone? They do seem as though that they were probably involved if they left the uh, roadside cafe at the same time as the Martins. Again, why were they not investigated further? Lots of unanswered questions. Well, it's been an eventful year, to say the least. 
in the run-up to Christmas. Uh, not terribly unhappy to see this year go out. I hope next year is a vast improvement. Uh, I do hope that I've been able to bring you a bit of entertainment, uh, while in, in some cases some of you may have been in lockdown. Uh, and I do feel that when I speak that I'm sort of talking to you all there, wherever you are, that I'm actually with you and we're, you know, we're in a sort of big hall together, uh, keeping warm, drinking cocoa or whatever your choice of poison is, and uh, it's a nice feeling. Yeah, I do feel a community feeling indeed, and I want to thank you all for your support. Uh, those who have been on my Patreon for a long time, loyal supporters, I'm very indebted to that, and to all the newcomers too, thank you for your support. Hope you stay around. Got lots of interesting cases to dig up and reinvestigate. Yeah, it's been it's been a ride, hasn't it? Actually, I feel like one of those old-time radio presenters. Um, back in the day, they would have episodes every week or every day, you know, sort of thrillers or crime episodes, and they would they would do all the sound effects and stuff. I used to listen to one in Australia in my twenties, where, where I worked uh, with with a team. We'd we'd listen every day. They'd have a it was like on for like 15 minutes a day that have this crime episode. Uh, so I'm sort of doing that, isn't it? Except with visuals. You've got the sound effects and visuals. So if this gig ever fails, maybe I can become a, a radio presenter. I had a dream many months ago that I had a sort of a really old-fashioned you know, recording studio with a big old-fashioned microphone. It's like a lighthouse or something that nobody could get to me. and I could sort of broadcast from there anonymously. <laughs> i tell you what it looked like. It looked like the landscape in Sin City. If any of you have seen that film, you know what I mean. I think there's a part one and part two. There may be even a part three. I don't know. haven't seen the movie for many years, but you know how the mind is. It stores memories like that away in little filing cabinets for future dream sets. Everything was sort of um, rusted and uh, eerie looking. Just up my alley. Okay, I'm going to love you and leave you. And uh, what, what am I going to say? What was I going to say? Oh, yes, the giveaway this month is going to be probably two main prizes. So, yeah, quite special this month for December. For the last month of 2020, two main giveaway prizes. You just have to wait and see what they are. My dear friends, take care. Love and blessings to you, and until the next time, goodbye.